think you could see that. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I the side of his keyboard. Oh my gosh. That was awesome. You did fix it. And I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what it was. Hello, Facebook Nation. We're sorry we late. We were having some technical dif difficulties. My phone was rotating. I was trying to get it back correct. So I'm sorry, so sorry for that, but we will go a little bit longer because we're starting about eight minutes late. Hello, Miss Dominique. <laughs> Good evening, how's everyone doing? Uh, we don't have a lecture per se for tonight. I wanted Dr. Finch um, to talk about his thoughts on the controversy around the Little Mermaid. Um, the Little Mermaid, they're going, Disney's going to make a live action movie on the Little Mermaid and they casted an African American female for the role. Her name is Halle Bailey, not to be confused with Halle Berry. Uh, she's very talented, especially with her singing and I think that's what really won her the role. But I wasn't keeping up on it, but I've been told that there's been some controversy around it. Some, some people have been disgruntled who shall remain nameless. <laughs> But I wanted, um, since you actually, um, you were the one to kind of, you know, take the initiative to, to, to make a comment on that. And I want you to expound on why you think um, Haley Bailey will make a good choice for The Little Mermaid mm -hmm. and just talk more about mermaids in general. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, of course, mermaids are considered fictional or mythical characters, rather like unicorns and dragons. Um, and that's how we think about things. We live in a world which we think is reality. Um, though as what is it, uh, Hamlet said to Horatio, there are more things under heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your philosophy. I think we finding out that sort of thing more and more. Um, now, I have been to places, West Africa and especially Jamaica, interestingly enough. This was about eight years ago seven or eight years ago, he went to the mouth of a river, I forget the name of the river, sorry, I think it was in Port Antonio, near Port Antonio, where the people there says they have seen mermaids. I, I didn't dispute them. I said, oh. I said, okay, again, I just in my own mind, I says, you know, there are more things under heaven and earth than are dreamed of in one's philosophy. They say mermaids come, not, not all the time, not frequently, they're rare sightings, but there have been actual sightings of mermaids. What is to be said to that? West Africa also. So, uh, and the, the controversy seems to be stemming around the fact that the cartoon version of The Little Mermaid, red-haired and white-skinned, basically, you know. And what is a mermaid? Let's be sure we understand what a mermaid is. A mermaid is uh, uh, half, female, uh, half female and half fish. There are mermen, of course, who are half men and half fish. The top bodies are male, or excuse me, human, and the bottom are fishtails. Right? Now again, this just seems, how could there be such a creature? Uh, I, I'm not prepared to answer any of that, or if there, even if there is such a creature, all I'm saying is that in certain parts of the world, uh, the existence of them is taken pretty much for granted. Not commonly, not seen everywhere, but uh, there are those in those parts of the world who say they do exist, and that they have their own kingdoms or queendoms beneath the waters, so to speak. Right? Now, why is that important? Why is that interesting? For uh, you know the things that we've been discussing over the last, well, almost a year, year and a half, however long it's been, um, because there is a major West African deity, a major West African deity and, uh, who is female. Her name is Mamiwata, Mamiwata Yensu. She's not the only one, by the way, who I, but I, that's the one I know. She is always depicted as a mermaid. Uh, let, let's not say always most often depicted as a mermaid, very often with a serpent around her neck. And we've talked about her before, but she is considered the, one of the, the great mother of the waters, all right? Now, there are other great mothers of the waters. Uh, among the Yoruba, there's Yemanya and Oshun. Yemanya is the great mother of the ocean. Oshun is the mother of the rivers and lakes. Uh, in ancient Egypt, it was Hathor and Nut. 
Newt was the great mother of the waters of the heavenly waters. Hathor was she who presided over the earthly waters. In Senegal, it is uh, uh, Mam Kumbalamba and Njare. All right, Mam Kumbalamba is the one who presides over the ocean. Njare uh, presides over the fresh water. So there's this, what do you want to call it? They make a, this, I don't know if it's worth so much of a distinction, they divide their realms. The mother goddess has the ocean, the daughter goddess has the um, fresh waters and rivers, lakes, streams. Now, why is this not so far-fetched? Where did life come from? Ocean. Life came out of the ocean. One-celled organisms. Out of the ocean. I don't know how many, I, I think I used to know the figure of how many billions of years ago. And uh, once, uh, and began the process of evolution that led to the more, most diverse life forms. Now, and this is the good part. <laughs> these were one cell organisms. These one cell organisms started, were able to divide. But in the process of dividing, they were able to differentiate themselves. And what do I mean by that? How can I tell you? <laughs> these one cell organisms, if we put a gender to them, were female. But then they created this male. Why? Because that created the diversification, diversity necessary, excuse me, for, for evolution. All right? Now, as if that weren't enough, in some country in West Africa, I think it's a Cameroon, there are, it might be elsewhere in West Africa, but this is one I've heard about. There are frogs in a certain lake where, if, there are only females in the lake, female frogs, out of themselves, they create males. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then with that, they are able to diversify and multiply. This is even, you can even kind of see something similar in ancient Kemet. Because Isis, or Aset, is the mother of Horus, but originally she is also the mother of Osiris, who later becomes his sister wife. Okay? Now, <laughs> we have a hard time processing these kind of ideas. They're kind of foreign to us. They are um, ideas that we can't, we can't, cons we can't uh, get our minds around. Nonetheless, there they are. So the, so the little mermaid being cast, so, uh, sorry, Mami Wata is the great mother of the waters, always depicted as a um, mermaid. Very similar to Yemanya Oshun. I call her, I think of Yemanya Oshun as one, mother-daughter. Or uh, Kumbalamba Njari in Senegal, all right? Uh, uh, Hathor Nut in ancient Egypt. And Mami Wata is a, uh, you might say, a unified version of all of them. And she's always depicted as a mermaid. And she's the great mother of the waters. She brings all the waters into being and all the life that comes out of the waters as well. Mm -hmm. That's why she's called Mami Wata. Someone asked me as I was saying this, a friend of mine says, well, what? Has she always been called Mami Wata? No, I don't think so. Wata comes obviously from water, and that's kind of recent. That's late 19th century. But Mami has probably been a name of hers for a long time. How long? How far does she go back? Oh, my goodness. I know she goes, that goes back to Sumer, Sumer. Well, there you go. Okay. Mami. And, and Kemet, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and, but Mami Wata, as such, is somewhere between 700 and 1400 years old, all right? So she is a deity beyond time. And she brings all things and all life into being. And she comes from our conceptualization. She comes out of Africa. Because we're going to say something. You know where the Sumerians came from? Mm -hmm. Africa. Yeah. yeah they, they, were, they, were, from, they were, their yeah, language, yeah. their language was Cushitic. Yeah. This is Sumerians. You know, because people don't want to say, well, the Sumerians were the original civilization with the first civilization well uh, that obviously that was not true but let's not even get into that argument whether they were or they weren't they were Kushites yes and, and the people who dis discovered them said that first yes and so they and started they're, trying to change that their later. language was closest to the Kushitic language what is the Kushites Kushites are the Ethiopians mm -hmm. okay that's what so that's what Sumer so you can't get around the black origin of civilization of, P, of human beings and civilization and by the way they now have found out, interestingly enough, through D, uh, 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 Y chromosome studies, human beings like you and me, modern human beings, now can be traced back to Africa instead of a mere 290,000 years, 
342,000 years. Mm-hmm. Modern human yeah, beings. That's... Also in Africa. Oh, someone will remind you that the, um, the, the uh, symbol in Starbucks is a mermaid. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You coffee, you drink, okay. yes, you sure is. And you, and you see mermaid symbolism more and more. They and got it from a goddess symbol, too, yes. actually. One random. Yeah, no. Yeah. I don't know what they had in mind, but now, they, they did take it from that. I have mentioned this, I'm sure, in previous uh, encounters because I talk about it a lot. 20 years from now, yeah, I know I said this, but let's talk, say it again. Repetition is the essence of learning. A friend of mine taught me that years ago. 20 years from now, we're in the age of Pisces. Mm-hmm. The age of Pisces, two fishes. And who was the avatar of the age of Pisces, uh, the two fishes? Well, we know who that was. Jesus, Jesus the who, who took two fishes and a loaf of bread and fed the multitudes. Jesus the Christ. In 20 years, his age ends. Or the, I should say the age of the Piscean age ends. And the age that comes after it, 20 years from now, is the age of Aquarius. But Aquarius is not originally male. Aquarius was originally female. It's more appropriate to call her Aquaria. Mm. So you're coming up on the age of the great mother of the waters. No wonder you can see so much powerful feminine energy beginning to make itself felt in the affairs of the world. Now, even ancient Egypt, late in ancient Egypt history, this is almost to almost the time of Christ, um, the Aquarian figure was Hapi the god, mm-hmm. male god of the Nile. Mm-hmm. Except for one thing. <laughs> Hapi is always depicted with a female breast. Hmm. So that means she was, he was originally female. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even okay. that far back too. They always change. So Sex. if you're wondering what the age, you know, you're talking about the dawning of the age of Aquarius. I'm old enough to remember that, uh, that musical hair. The, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. It was a little premature because that age, and we can talk about that why I say it's premature at another time. But it comes, but in 20 years it'll be here. Already we have been seeing and being feeling the effects and the uh, uh, influence of the Divine Feminine in her manifestation of the Great Mother of the Waters. And the waters are not just in, uh, on Earth. They're the waters of the heavens. Mm-hmm. The heavens are imagined as waters Rain, of a great, a great heaven of waters. That's why Newt, who is a sky goddess, is also a, uh, an ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, is the one who gives rain. Mm-hmm. All right? So uh, this movie is, is, enti- is right on time with this actress. Mm. I mean, this is real. This is true. Now, uh, a lot of people are, are what, do they, what do they say, grinding their teeth about it. I can't help that. <laughs> you, know, you know, they're getting... Uh, 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 I'm, I, I, in a way, I'm surprised that Disney has been as, uh, what do you want to say, as courageous as they have been in casting this young woman. But you know what they say about publicity. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Yeah. <laughs> so they're... They go, go see it. <laughs> yeah. Now, all the, uh, I think Disney secretly is glad for all of the, I'm just guessing, is glad for all the hoopla because it'll create interest in the movie. And, you know, that can't be a bad thing for Disney. But the fact that they have cast this young woman, Hallie Bailey, um, is, is entirely on point to the, what do you want to call it, the timing and the effects of this coming age that affects everybody, mm-hmm. okay? Everybody, all right? So people have wondered, how is it that the feminine rose is the way it has been rising? Well, these things are cosmically determined. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Everything that happens on Earth has mm-hmm. a cosmic determination. And this goes back 3,000 years. Well, 3,000 years ago, you, you found that the feminine was being suppressed, oppressed, and repressed. Mm. 2,000 years was when it intensified into what we think of as our, what do you call it, our universalistic religions. And has been like that for 2,000 years. Uh, but that, 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 that's that coming to change. an end. That's, no, might. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna <laughs> to change. You know? I'm Don't not, get my hopes up. I, 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 oh, uh, I'm not even hoping. I don't use those words anymore, hope or try. Uh, it's, it's there. It's, it's written. <laughs> you know, you're talking about something that's written. It's written in the heavens if you know how to read. Mm-hmm. If you had to know how to read the heavens and know what you read and how, where it comes and how it comes. So, anyway, she is the right one. All right. Uh, she is uh, Halle, Haley, excuse me, Hallie. Excuse me, Hallie Bailey. Excuse me, Hallie Bailey. Because she, she's going to, she's, she's like Oshun. 
okay? Mm -hmm. And she's like, um, uh, what do we say, Hashum, Hashum, but she's also like Mamiwata. And she's like Njari in Senegal. But she also encompasses all of the aspects of the waters. And especially since, you know, she comes out of the, comes out of the waters. And it's entirely appropriate. Now, let me just say this about mermaids, and then if we, we, can, we can go on. Mermaids look like, you know, when you, when you start thinking about if, the, if mermaids are real, we won't get into whether they are or not, okay? <laughs> if they're real. You can, you don't, you don't, I'm asking you to believe. Right? You can reject that. Go ahead, reject it. They always look like the part of the world where you find them. Mm. The Chinese mermaids, the Japanese mermaids look Chinese and Japanese. African mermaids look like Africans. European mermaids look like Europeans. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure how that all works, but there it is. But see, this whole business about Atlantis and these cities under the sea, you saw that movie Aquaman. I like that movie, Aquaman, because it is very much, it was very much, shall we say, to the point of what's, what's happening, okay? What's happening. And as I say, um, uh, we're not, we probably are not ready for what's, what's going to reveal itself, you know. But, you know, I'm kind of, I'm just kind of perseverating a little bit. So I don't want to keep just going off on tangents. But um, this little mermaid and this casting is entirely on point in this time and place. And that's an, arch oh, an archetype. Let me use that term, you know. She is uh, a mythotype, an archetype, and a power. A power that is also of heaven and also of earth, and especially in the waters, whether it's the earthly waters or the heavenly waters. All right. Now, oh, one last, not one last thing, but another thing. Yeah, you know, and I got this from Native Americans. Uh, there was a period in my life when I was spending a lot of time with Native Americans. And they said there are four colors, there are four colors in the world, and they correspond to the four major race, races, okay? And the elements. <laughs> they said, um, let me get this right now. The, the, let's see, air, earth, fire. Okay, the white race is, is um, fire. The uh, yellow race or the Chinese race is air, earth, earth. Hmm. No, air, earth, fire, water, air, earth, fire, water. No, uh, no, no, air. The, the or, oriental race you know, is air, according mm -hmm. to, I'm just talking about this, this, this particular system. The uh, earth element is red and therefore Native American. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> Who are the peoples of the waters? Oh, the black race. Yes. Look at every mythology. I, 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 I challenge those of you watching this. Go and look at the mythology of every African peoples that you can get your hands on. You will see they will always say that people, African peoples in particular, came out of the waters and are of the waters. And once upon a time, they used to take care of the waters because black people are supposed to take care of the waters, you know. I don't we, think we do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> Uh-oh, we don't, and oh. it's a problem. Maybe that's what's happening in New we Orleans. Don't even get in the water half I, the time. Yeah, I don't know what the New Orleans <laughs> is going on in there, but, you know, I think it's New Orleans. Isn't that where they have the floods? Yeah, but, I mean, we are supposed to take care. You're supposed to take care of, quote, every element that you belong. Oh, this, is Native, this is what the Native Americans used to say. Y'all need to get back in the water learn how to swim. Yeah, but you need to take care. Keep. You can't pollute it. Like polluting your own house. That's your element. That's, that's, the, that's the element of black people of African descent, yes. Mm. Now, like I said, the Indians are supposed to take care of the Indians, Native Americans will take care of the earth. Mm. Europeans are supposed to take care of the fire, and I'm not talking about blowing things up, which is how they use fire. Mm. <laughs> and then the um, Orientals. I knew is, that was because somebody says the fire represents destruction. Yeah. No, and, no, there's, there's the fire of no, the no, earth. No, 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 not always there's destruction. There's fire of the yeah, earth. Yeah, there, there, there is the productive and creative fire as yeah. well. And because, fire creates Because earth. the sun, S-U-N, and there's Ra in ancient Egypt, okay, and Sekhmet, who is the lion goddess. And then, of course, as I say, the, um, the, spiritual, the spiritualization of things that you see in the Orient is entirely consistent with their connection to the air, okay? Mm -hmm. 
yes. into the heavens. Yes. You know, right. this is what Native. This is I got this from Native Americans. I I didn't read this. Um, this was years ago. This was twenty years ago. Anyway, Ooh. yeah. Is there an age? I I saw a comment earlier. Is there an age called an uh, age of segment? Not of segment as such. You say oh, you say now segment member is the lion goddess, mm -hmm. and therefore she represents the fiery heat of the sun. Uh, interesting enough, she's destructive on the one hand, but she's also the healing deity on the other. Because she can bring death, she can also prevent death. Now, therefore, she belongs to the age of Leo. Okay. Well, the age of Leo is, is, you know, that was the, you know, see, ancient Egypt started things in the summertime and the solstice during the time of Leo. And that includes the 26,000 year cycle you heard me talk about. So Leo has come and gone, and we're now processing to the end of Pisces and then Aquarius. And um, let's see, let's see, Leo, Gemini, Taurus, no, Taurus, Aries, the Aquarius, uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to get distracted that way, but everything comes around. So the age of Leo come, will eventually come back around. But the point is, it's, this is where the cycle and the calendar cycle started for the ancient Egyptians was in the time of Leo. And that would be Atum, who is also Adam, and Sekhmet, who is the lion goddess or the lion deity. All right? So, um, yeah. And <laughs> that's, where you, that's why uh, you know, I say the heavens are a book. Mm. They, they are a book, a calendar, and a guide. And we have to reestablish re our connection to the heavens. And it isn't going to happen in your lifetime. You know, people say, get mad at me when I say it's going to take 500 years to resurrect this. And they say, oh no, it can't possibly take that. Oh yeah, it's going to take that long. Because you, you, you don't have a concept of all the things that got lost. You mean for them like worldwide? Yeah, worldwide. Because it doesn't have to take 500 years for like just uh, one group to resurrect it. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is, you plant seed. You got to be seed planters. Mm -hmm. And as you say, er, small groups, not large, small groups can plant and cultivate seeds that allows them to move forward. But if you're talking about the entire world, hum, human world, yeah, you're talking 500 years. And I'm not backing away from that. You know, I'm not saying you have to like it, uh, but I've accepted it, all right? Uh, and because if, you're t if the ancient people of Kemet and Africa used to talk about 26,000 year cycles, that's the way they used to think, 500 years, well, what is that? Because everybody wants it done in their lifetimes, or maybe the lifetimes of their children, grandchildren, or in this century. No, you gotta put the time back in. I mean, how long did it take the world, to the African world to disintegrate? Yeah, how long did it take that? About 500 years. No, about 500 years. <laughs> no, I, didn't I mean, mean I, I, I mean from the start <laughs> to, uh, to 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 where we are now. I didn't Almost think he's 500, 500 years. So I'm gonna take it another 500. Yeah, get it right. you, you okay. gotta, and you you, you you know you've got to uh, mm. you gotta come to terms with these things. I'm not like I said. I'm not I'm not I'm not here to you know make you feel good. I make it here. I'm gonna make you be. Uh, real about what the not only the present is, but what the future is, are going to be, so, or has to be now if we survive. Oh, someone made an interesting comment. Now I don't know, you know, I don't know myself. I would tend to probably agree, but the Bible is a book of astronomy and astrology as well. There, there are parts of it are uh, they're very much like that. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. God, you can always find something in the Bible, like uh -huh. anything yeah, you, you want can. to research. Can. But I mean, uh, yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> What can I tell you? And if you start looking at, the, if you read the Bible in a certain way, mm -hmm. a, I, I, mean, uh, I mean, come on, come on. The people, are the, the so-called children of Israel, where did, where did they get started? And how long they did got, they stay there? They were in Egypt for like four or 500 years. 430 years. Yeah. How could they not be uh, profoundly impacted mm -hmm. by that sojourn in Egypt? And they probably brought some Egyptians along with them. Well, some people, you know what people say, a lot of some, there are some people say, uh, they were Egyptians. Yeah, yeah they were culturally. Egyptians. By they then. were Egyptians who had uh, revolted from the established religion. Mm -hmm. That's that's one idea. Mm -hmm. But you know, they, I'm not. I don't want to get into that controversy or defend it or not or you know pro promote it. But um, yeah, they were profoundly affected by that 430 year sojourn. They couldn't. Like we, like like black people here would be like saying we're 
if we went back to Africa, we'd be just like Africans, like we never left. But that's not true. We've been here. And we've been affected by European culture, and we've made our own culture as well. And mm-hmm. that kind of mix makes us just different. Mm-hmm. But we're certainly Im- impacted mm-hmm. <laughs> by American culture for sure. And Christianity would be the the biggest impact mm-hmm. on on uh, on us as blacks. Mm-hmm. Actually, that's one thing we just took it. We were like, okay. If Give us on your religion, we'll take if, it. If you don't think you're impacted, then <laughs> you're not going to watch any more TV. <clears throat> you know? You're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to walk outside your house. Because everything you do, everything you have, comes out of and from this, uh, from this culture. And you, you know, you don't allow, you, you know, you, you accept that reality and you build on the reality to come. All right, Dad. With the, with the few more minutes that we have left, I wanted you to talk about a little bit what the book that you're writing. Um, mm-hmm. If you want to give the title, you can, but yeah. um, <clears throat> I'll, let, I'll leave that up to you. But I, I also just want to spend a little time and allowing you to discuss um, what you're writing about. I finished it, actually. Yeah, I mean, sorry. Yes, what you wrote yeah. about yeah, and the, what is what the, is to it's be a, it's a, one of your grandest, greatest works yet. It's, it's a 590-page manuscript entitled The Gift of the Nile from, uh, geez, I actually think I go back to about 10,000 B.C. all the way to um, the death of Cleopatra. You know, I, found, I realized during my studies, Cleopatra, we always, I always thought that she was just Greek or Macedonian. No, her mother was Egyptian, yeah, which is the like reason that. why she, really she what she was trying to do was was bring Egypt back to Egypt, mm, you might say. Yeah. You know, and this was, and she had to deal with Anthony, uh, Anthony and, uh, and, and Julius, Julius uh, Caesar because they were the ones who were in the process of taking over the world. Mm. And she manipulated both of them, mm. you know. Sounds but... So anyway, uh, it's a gift of the Nile, mm-hmm. um, and we uh, look at how civilization took root. First of all, uh, where yeah, civilization generally in the ancient civilization Kemet took root where, not in the Nile Valley, the but in region. in the Great Lakes region, mm-hmm. of what that's we today today call Tanzania, Uganda, etc. And that's where and they that, migrated from. That's where they migrated from. The followers of Horus. Mm. And they uh, used to call it, it turned around, they call it the spirit land. Yeah, the land of the, was that or, the land of the gods? Land of the gods, land okay. of the spirits, or holy land was I there. Punt, punt, too. What is that? Yeah, punt, punt, punt? Is, uh, punt is what we today think of as Ethiopia, okay? Mm-hmm. Or Somaliland. Yeah, or Somaliland, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. So the ancient Egyptians, you know, there, there was, we spent years, centuries even, uh, debating on who the ancient Egyptians were and where they came from. Why? Uh, civilization, as you, we and you understand it, comes from there. Mm-hmm. That means all the civilization that we are in now. Greece, you know, yes. Crete, Greece, um, all the civilization yeah. of the Levant, which is Canaan. Uh, you know, Europe, um, Western Europe, America, Canada, etc., yeah. etc. It all, it can, all is easily can. You, it's not even hard. You can trace it back, not only to Africa, northern Africa, northeastern Africa, which is Kemet, but all the way back to the uh, spirit land or the. Uh, so, oh, some people used to call that area. Some Egyptians used to call it the placenta land. The placenta, yeah, Takenset. Takenset. Yeah. It means placenta land. I got that from your book, Dad. And, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's also where I know the, the east. Rift Valley, the East Rift Valley. Valley. That's the Rift Valley is kind of where humans evolved. Kenya and Tanzania. They first evolved, and then they went to they followed the rivers down to the Great Lakes region because that was their that was their, you know, it was like a oasis. It was like a paradise for them. Yeah. And now remember the what, what did you know what did the ancient Egyptians say? They used to say down north and up south. Because mm-hmm. they looked at north. Yeah, and, they they looked at they, the, came they from. looked at the south. From as where they came from, first four, hmm, first south, yeah. foremost chief beginnings origins was always from the south. Mm-hmm. That's why the name of my uh, our publishing company is Kenti Publications because Kenti means first and foremost and south in ancient Egyptians mm-hmm. and beginnings, and that is where they looked. Mm-hmm. All right, they uh, the and they used to send expeditions down there, and you know who they used to bring back. The people we so called call the so called pygmies. The pygmies. Oh, the twa. Them. The twa. Yeah, they, but, yeah. you know, today we call them pygmies. They thought Why? they were the first people. Because, yeah, they knew. Mm. They knew that they were the first people. And one of their deities was often represented in twa slash pygmy form. 
Ta. 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 Mm-hmm. The creator, the artif- art, our, That's our artificer. That's one of their oldest ones. Yes. You know, based off like Bess. Yes, and Bess is another Bess one. Bess the pygmy. Yes. In, fact, in fact, when uh, <laughs> there was one, this is an Egyptian annals. They, uh, these are direct quotes. When they, they, they sent an expedition up the Nile to the Great Lakes region, and the pharaoh at the time, I forget which one it was, sent a, uh, uh, you know, they said they were going to bring back emissaries from the people who they, they didn't call them the Toir, they called them <laughs> Deng. That's what they called them, Deng. Deng. Oh, D-E-N-G. They yeah. have a new name uh, for them. And um, they were, what we would call the Toir, the Pygmies, and there were, I think, two of them they were bringing. And the pharaoh sent a fast sailing boat, says, I want you to protect those Deng day and night. Mm. There, you can't. They can't fall over into Aww. the river. You can't. Uh, I want more than anything else in this world to meet these dang or so-called pygmies. They had a what do you want to call it? They had a reverence for them, almost an awe, because you know why? <laughs> That's hum- they knew humanity. This is where humanity emerged from, and from these people. Yeah, and, and it's been scientifically confirmed, not only the um, Khoi and the San, the Khoi San, but the Pygmy people of Africa, which are, have different ethnic groups, Batwa, um, the, the, um, the Twa, but there's just other names for them too. I can't think of all their names, but um, they also have this, that DNA that says that they come from the most ancient strain. Oh, of course. Um, I mean, uh, biologists oh, know humans. it. In fact, in fact, that's not even argued anymore. Okay, yeah. that's not even an argument because the biochemical studies, the genetic studies, are are so unequivocal about that. You know, and the people of ancient Egypt knew that. All right, and so the book starts there, and it just goes uh, from dynasty to dynasty. Um, and um, the one of the things you wouldn't, you don't really see in ancient Egypt. I'm not saying there wasn't unrest, okay? I'm not saying that there were, there's even regicides. Every so often a pharaoh was killed, all right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not saying there wasn't unrest or trouble or regicides, and all, but there was never a revolution. Mm-hmm. Not one. Nothing that even remotely resembled a revolution, okay? The ancient people of Kima had no desire to change their culture, their society, their nationality, their nation. You know, and uh, the only people now, you know, you talk about their temples. The only people who came into their temples up until the time of Pythagoras, 560, uh, 560 BC, are the so called Cushites. Yeah, because they knew they came from Cush. All right. So um, they, uh, the Cushites, you know, had temples and priests and had a, uh, what do you want to call it? a, um, same uh, Egyptian theology pantheon. and everything, every pantheon, everything. Yeah. So they realized that they were, you know, how the what I say is like comparing the English and the Scots, yeah, or the Italians and the uh, Sicilians, yeah, right. They, they were, they, you know, is it, that kind of relationship, uh, relationship uh, between them, and nearly always, <laughs> nearly always, let's not say always, when a pharaoh needed a queen or was going to marry a queen, mm-hmm. he went down and married a Nubian queen. Wow. He never went outside of Egypt. Oh, Lord. The only no. way he went outside of Egypt was he was and, going and, to and, Nubia. And you know why? He was a typical of those pharaoh typical men. The most beautiful women came from Nubia. <laughs> but it wasn't just that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> they wanted to protect the bloodline. They didn't want that. And the, all, none of that. Uh, and, and none <laughs> of that the, too. None of they that. They were the uh, most yeah, beautiful women. They were beautiful. They and were. Um, they still are. Yeah, they are. You have to go and see them. The Dinka and all of yeah, them. Yeah, and uh, you know, and they Nubians, are, yeah. whether that's what they yeah. are, they're Nubian. They know who they are, down there in Aswan, up there in Aswan. I guess is what really what you should say. Mm-hmm. And um, they, um, uh, so the, the, you know, modern historians like to distinguish between uh, Kemet and Kush, and they and they mm-hmm. always like to point up. Yeah, they were sometimes they warred against one another. Well, so what? Yeah. I mean, the Americans had a civil that war. That was their only real competition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until Pythagoras was the first non-African to be allowed to be trained in the temples. Mm. And why was he allowed? Because his mother was Phoenician. Oh, and they had a close and the, relationship. Oh, yeah, the Phoenicians, Phoenicians were basically well, oh, Palestinian know. Egyptians. I didn't know 
that. Yeah. And Pythagoras', Pythagoras his mother is... was Phoenician. Pythagoras. And also he was a genius too. I mean, no, he was an yeah. extraordinary he was an extraordinary man by any definition. And he spent uh, twenty two years in the temples of Egypt studying. And when he came out, when when, it, when he I don't even want to say graduated, but when he started going out and spreading his the Pythagorean doctrine, which was really the doctrine of the temple. He didn't call it the Pythagorean doctrine. It was called that later on. He was like the ancient Egyptians. Oh, he he never would allow anybody who was his students, himself or anybody else, to discuss or disclose anything that was discussed or taught in his classroom. You couldn't leave Pythagoras' uh, classes or his, no, they were class, that's not a good word. You know, those select individuals, very select individuals, that he chose to be the recipients of his teachings, which of course were the teachings that descended down through Kemet, you, they never opened their mouth. They never would disclose, all, for year, hundreds of years, what they learned. He drilled that into them so much that they, it, it, they, they, they didn't even think about uh, saying anything about what they had learned out to outsiders. Because mm -hmm. you see, that, that was the inflexible rule of Kemet. That it's even been said that if in Kemet, someone uh, was, shall we say, um, in, um, <laughs> uh, it didn't happen. If you, if you were someone who had in some way started out and imbibed some of the knowledge of the temples, and you were as incautious enough to let it be known the priest would send people after you and track you down to the ends of the earth and slit your throat. Oh, really? Yeah, they would. Yeah, I mean, they weren't dead. No, no, that, that, wasn't, that was serious business. You did not reveal anything. I'm not saying that happened more than, I think it may have happened a handful of times. Mm -hmm. They would track you down anyway. They would track you down around the globe if they had to. Mm -hmm. Take you out. You know, I mean, like I said, that wasn't frequent. I mean, like I said, you... Maybe, and then that was late too. If that happened at all, it happened late in the period because they were very closed mouth. They just, they would rather, oh, there was a, there was a, um, a woman who was a priest. Uh, she was, this is late too. This isn't even an Egyptian woman. This is a Greco-Macedonian woman who was uh, um, uh, uh, also was a, uh, was a, was a initiate into the temples and they captured, they captured her. Uh, and they were going to torture her in order for her to reveal what she had learned. She found a knife and slit her own throat. Oh, someone wants... There's a question about why Why does it need to be so secret? Okay, you might... I'm going to ask you a question. Atomic energy. Hmm. Okay. Shouldn't that have been kept secret? Oh, the point is, here's what I'm saying. The power of that knowledge was mm -hmm. such that um, it could, uh, I don't know what you it want could, to say. It was powerful, let's just say it, that. It, it was, yeah, <laughs> it, it would uh, uh, upset the balance of the world. They really weren't supposed to be, though, you know, when they unlocked the secrets of the atom, that was supposed to have been kept secret too. They didn't, but that was supposed to. Yeah. There's certain knowledge you you cannot allow out of its protected protected space. No, knowledge is power. Just that's all you need to know. <laughs> knowledge is power, and when it can be used against you, just as much as it can be used for you. Mm -hmm. um, also, I, I know someone had a question about the ancient bloodline that I brought up. I know that the Egyptians um, only married. Um, they had other wives. But the um, the hereditary princesses were always um, oh yeah always either from Nubia or from e Egypt, Egypt. Yeah. They, they couldn't be from Mesopotamia no, they no, couldn't no, be no. from Absolutely Asia not. they in have, fact, I'll take them as wives but they won't be they can't inherit the no. throne in fact Pharaoh the children can't inherit the, the throne. pharaohs always the, the, the no male pharaoh inherited it was yeah. always inherited through the female line which was the reason for a consanguinity or incest yeah. royal incest. Okay, and also I, I also ha have this idea. Now the ancient Egyptians knew the, the deleterious effects of incest, so every three hundred years they changed dynasties, 
And my assumption, as always, assumption, is they did that because the previous dynasty's bloodline had become devitalized. Is that the word? As a result of this um, this custom of royal incest. Yeah, because you had to, if you wanted to keep the uh, the throne in the family, then there had to be a brother or a half brother marry to marry a sister. Because it didn't come from through him, it came through her. And that never changed. Never changed. Even, that was even true of Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. She married her brother, her brother married her. Yeah. All right, um, so I, the question was kind of like, where, where would be the ancient bloodline today? But I don't know if that's, Really ancient blood, ancient blood. Oh, I, yeah, oh, I have this idea that the ancient Egyptians, what do you want to call it, the priest or the royal family? I don't know. They, they haven't disappeared. They haven't. Hmm. They're underground. Hmm. Or if they walk among us, you wouldn't know who they were. <laughs> but they have. They haven't gone anywhere. If they walk among us. No. Are they still in Africa? Are they still in Egypt? I think they're in a lot of different places. Uh, Northeast Africa, East Africa, West Africa, and I think, yeah, here too. So there may be some descendants there. We just don't but you know. don't know, but you, you'll never know. <laughs> you will never until know. Until this them. time, until they want you to know, right, Dad? Kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I know there was a few others, but uh, a few other questions, but um, we're going to have to wrap up since it's you know, getting to be that time. And we adjo we appreciate you, as always, spending your evenings um, listening to Dr. Finch's ideas, thoughts, um, his lectures, his, his writings, um, and then, you know, just interacting with each other. That's always wonderful to see as well. Uh, we, we are here every other week and hope you, you enjoy it. Um, not much else I've mentioned that um, about the Egypt trip next year. Oh yeah, I do. I do need to say something about okay. that. The it's called the Gift of the Nile tour. Uh, it's July sixteenth to the twenty seventh. Uh, that will be yeah next year. Uh, if you want to, I'm happy to send anybody any information. They just need to get in touch with me at Charles S Finch at gmail dot com. Mm -hmm. Charles S Finch at gmail.com. It will have two S's in it. So just remember, Charles S. Finch at gmail.com. Happy to send you a brochure, or you can get in touch with Consolidated Tours. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have their address in, the, in my head, but they're. Yeah, they can just email yeah, you. Yeah. Um, also, uh, the book, there's no date yet. Um, no date but yet. But we're aiming for the next six to eight months. To get uh, that published. I hope and we, so. I, of course, I, you will be the first to know. <laughs> I, I hope it's more like six months than eight months. But, you know, yeah. Absolutely. It's ready. <laughs> There's even more photographs, more illustrations than I've ever done before. And for the first time, um, color photos. I'm so excited. I'm reading it already. Okay. So, um, have a wonderful evening, you wonderful people. <laughs>